Mr. Mayor, thank you for taking the time to talk with us. Let's start with the RNC. And uh, first of all, let's talk about that big decision that was made by the president last week to cancel the RNC in Jacksonville. And we saw you respond on the networks. Right. Um, talking about one person, one news anchor asked you if the president told you ahead of time that he was going to make that decision or if you found out, like the rest of us, when the president was speaking from the White House and just said it. So were you notified ahead of time by the president? Uh, well, first, let me say I spoke to the president on Friday uh, to talk about he thanked me, thanked the city for all of our efforts. Uh, he actually took a few minutes and said hello and spoke to my youngest daughter, Bridget. So he, we had a good personal moment there. What was happening leading up to the cancellation was we had been communicating with the RNC, uh, the planners, uh, and the White House uh, through the chief of staff. The president's a busy person. We're not going to you know, be trying to get him on the phone to talk about the convention. So communicating through the chief of staff that th there were concerns, one of which, biggest of which, is COVID. Uh, while w we appear to have stabilized, not meaning our numbers are dropping, but they spiked. They're not spiking now. We're trying to drive them down. Uh, do we want to risk? Is there risk of community spread? And we may want to consider either shrinking or canceling in the best interest of public health. But we don't have to make that decision today. Let's just make sure we continue to communicate. And this and is what you told them. Yeah, that's we, yeah, we worked through the chief staff. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the president made the decision. It didn't surprise me because I knew the discussion was happening. Uh, but you know, folks, are, folks think, I've heard some suggest, well, the president didn't call and give a heads up. Uh, that wasn't very, people, people have criticized it if that happened. He called the next day. We had a personal conversation. We were on the phone for 15 minutes together. Uh, and he made the right decision. OK, so you had actually told the chief of staff you may want to consider canceling or suspending? We, our message was we ought to have a discussion about whether or not events should be, you know, there were discussions about outdoor events. Uh, we, I didn't say we, let's cancel this because of COVID. I said we need to keep an eye on this. And we very well could get to the point where that decision has to be made. We're not there. We don't know where we're going to be, and we still have weeks. We still have weeks out. Um, the president made the decision that this was the right time to do it, and I support it. And I guess there are some people who say, president in Washington, D.C., was able to look at Jacksonville and say, no, this is not the right time. We can't do it. You know the city very intimately. You're the mayor. Why wouldn't you make that call? Well, I still had weeks, and you know, one of the other things I would share, if, if a week or two weeks from now we were monitoring it, let's assume that didn't happen. And a week from now or two weeks, I looked at the numbers, I spoke with healthcare professionals and said, you know what, we just can't do this. Uh, it, it just doesn't make sense at this point in time. Uh, we were in regular communication with the RNC and the White House. Everyone would have been in agreement and we would have moved forward. The president just got there before we did, and uh, there was still plenty of time. I mean, if we were sitting here today without a canceled RNC, there would still be no people at health risk because we have weeks before there's actually people getting into town. But uh, that decision was made, and it was the right decision, and I'm glad he did it. So you still feel that you had a couple of weeks before making that call one way or the other? I think I probably had seven to 12 days ballpark, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, and also, we, we want to talk a little bit about um, money, contracts between the city and the RNC, why were none made at this point? The city, there was no obligation on behalf of the city. The RNC host committee, the host committee uh, was a nonprofit, private dollars raised by private citizens that contracted with the third party that runs the facilities, which frankly is no different than when you do a concert or you know, if, if somebody comes to town to play a show, they don't contract with the city. Uh, and I think the most important thing about this, this was not a taxpayer-funded event. There were private dollars were, were, were raised to put it on. Those private dollars uh, are used and will be used to settle any outstanding obligations. So how much money did the host committee raise? Uh, probably close to $20 million. So, and how much did the city spend already in preparing? The city didn't spend any money. No taxpayer dollars. So then what happens with that money? Uh, so they'll, whatever, so I say there's a difference between what they've raised and what was committed. So when you're fundraising, you get commitments and you go collect the dollars. They were in the process of collecting those commitments. Um, the co-chair of the host committee shared with me last week that they had collected enough dollars 
to pay any obligations they have. Because things have been happening, right? There's mm -hmm. been people here in hotels planning, so they'll pay those obligations. And then if there's any dollars left over, they'll work with the donors that contributed. The donors that give to these things, they understand they're supportive of the event, they're supportive of the president, and they're supportive of the decision. Okay. Um. I will say it's a, it's a it was the right decision. It doesn't change the fact that it's, 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 there's some disappointment involved. We were in safer at home orders. Businesses suffered uh, for months. Those, many of those businesses are still uh, trying to recover. I, I would also remind people that when we agreed to bring the convention here, in fact, when we made our first, when I made my first efforts in outreach, we were at three percent uh, cumulative positive in Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. uh, it looked like uh, it looked like a non-issue. Uh, even though we were still practice social distancing, do the right thing, I was saying encourage wearing masks. A week after we made the pitch, we dropped below 3%. We were down to 2.8, some in that range. And then we all know what started to happen in late June, early July, not only in Jacksonville, but the rest of the state. Uh, and so uh, I said when we made the pitch and when we secured it, that we would monitor the situation and make the appropriate decisions at the appropriate time to protect people. The president made the decision. And also, some are asking if it's if it's unsafe to have the RNC here, as far as COVID is concerned. Then, what does that say about opening schools? Well, the RNC would be uh, an event of thousands of people uh, for purposes, arguably for political slash recreational purposes, uh, unnecessary, non-essential. Mm -hmm. uh, when we were in safer at home orders, uh, essential workers still went to work, uh, and so. I believe, based on the information and data that we have, that uh, kids ought to have the option to go back to school. Uh, I think teachers that are vulnerable are concerned. They ought, those that make those decisions ought to figure out how to give them options as well. But parents and children that want to be back in the in-school learning ought to have that option. And what about your kids? Uh, when school, so I have, uh, my kids are in public schools, two of my kids are in public schools, one's in private. Uh, private school is planned to go back, and he's going back on time. And what grade is he? Uh, ninth grade. He'll be going into tenth. Okay. Uh, I have a daughter going into sixth and a daughter going into eighth. And uh, if school's open on time, they're, based on the information that I have right now, our family has made the decision that they're going back. So you'll feel comfortable with them going back during this pandemic? Based on the information I have today, yes. Look, we got to be smart. We got to. People should wear masks uh, when they're in situations that uh, they can't practice social distancing, or when they can, they ought to be washing their hands. They ought to be smart about not being in, in unnecessarily in big non-essential crowds where people are just, you know, partying or hanging out or taking unnecessary risks. But the, the people that were at home for months, including children, young people, the mental health. Uh, it, it's it, the economic strain. I mean, it, it cuts across so many uh, issues. Uh, I think that kids ought to have the option. Be, I want to be clear about that, though. I'm saying there ought to be options. We shouldn't force people uh, that may have vulnerable immune systems uh, or that may be concerned for other reasons. Okay. Now, I know there was uh, an article that just came out today um, that talks about the vulnerability of children in the hospitalizations. Um, if you don't mind me just reading a little bit from that. Let me find that here. Yes, it um, says child hospitalizations are up 23% here in Florida. This is an article that was uh, conducted by, by yeah. CNN talking about yep. the hospitalizations. Does that change your mind at all or bring you any more concern or to the point where you would want to at least have a discussion on changing things or does it I weigh at so, all? Yeah, so I think child hospitalizations went from 200 and something mm -hmm. children in the last couple of weeks to 300 and change. Um, anytime somebody's hospitalized, because of COVID-19, particularly someone ends up in, in intensive care. Uh, it's incredibly concerning uh, and you care for the families uh, and you wanna, make, you wanna do everything you can. You know the hospitals are doing everything they can to take care of those people. Um, but the virus is with us until we get a vaccine. And so we have to figure out how to live, 
how to work, how to, how to take care of our families, and how to learn in the safest way possible. I think part of that is giving parents and young people the option to go back to school if they feel good about it. Okay. But, but situations are, I said, given the information we have now, mm -hmm. we have, every single day we have to monitor um, what we know about this virus mm -hmm. and what we don't know and how things change. Would it be too much to say until we get a, why don't we just wait until we get that vaccine before we start opening everything up? I, I can't imagine, given what we know right now mm -hmm. uh, about uh, mortality rates uh, and the spread, that we would lock our kids in their homes for, what, a year, year and a half, two years? Uh, nobody really knows when we're going to get the vaccine. I've heard some say this year. I've had other experts, experts that disagree, by the way. Uh, we, those of us in leadership, those of us that are adults that aren't even in leadership positions, have to figure out how to navigate this in a way that is in the best interest of the community at whole, which includes uh, economics and people be able to take care of their families, and our young people, their learning, their ability to socialize in a safe way. Uh, and I, so I'm supportive, again, of kids having the option and their parents having the option to go back to school. Those that want to opt out ought to have other options as well. All right. Um, let's talk about, um, you know, now that the RNC is over, um, the city council, some of the members have said in the future they hope that they are involved in decisions like that. Is that something that you can agree to do, or is that some, a discussion that has to be had? Um, look, we hold events in this city on any given day uh, in the way our charter works. Uh, it, it doesn't go through city council. Uh, I can understand their expression and their concern. Uh, if, 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 if we were looking at another large event, th this was a unique situation. We had the opportunity when our positives were really low and declining uh, to go after uh, an event that was being pursued by other cities. Mm -hmm. And we had to move fast, and we did. And we secured it, and the uh, things changed. Uh, the president canceled it. Uh, but I understand city council's concern. By the way, contrary to some of the reports that I've seen, Tommy Hazuri and I were working together. Um, we built a relationship over the years. He had questions. Sometimes. Sometimes the way policy discussions play out through the media, and that's not a criticism of the media, it's just because media is not in the room when the discussions are happening. You guys only see the letters that go back and forth or the, the soundbite exchanges. Our relationship is cordial, it's good, uh, we work together, and I'm going to continue to work with that city council. I had numerous conversations with members of that council uh, weeks ago that I promised them that if things on the ground changed or didn't improve, uh, we would take action to make sure people were safe. So if there is a situation that arises like that again, is that something that you... I'd be open to that, yeah. You'd be open to yeah. involving the city council. Yeah. Um, uh, talking about the city council, the, the push to get the RNC here, it was unilateral with, with no input from the city council. Um, it ended after the council president said the support wasn't there. Just like the push to sell JEA ended when the city council president said the support wasn't there, um, the public did not support either effort. So why did you continue with both despite the public opposition? Well, look, I ultimately pulled the plug on the JEA. Uh, I put an end to it. I, I asked them to put an end to it. Uh, and then the, bo the, board, the board voted to do that. Um, in terms of uh, the RNC, uh, I thought we had an opportunity uh, to provide a shot of economic uh, activity into this economy that would help small businesses that have been in extreme pain. Some are, are concerned and, and may even end up having to close shop. Uh, so I think it was the right thing to do, and I think we ended up in the right place by uh, the president ultimately canceling it because of COVID-19. All right. Um now that the RNC is over, um, some want to know about your, your focuses now. One of those focuses, it, it, will it be on removing some of the Confederate statues or all of them? Is there a timeline for that? that that's happening. Uh, so what we're not going to just go tear statues down and dispose of them or they just disappear. Uh, right now, uh, folks in the arts community, the Cultural Council, Historic, there's a process, they're working the process, they're going to come down, they're going to be moved, 
and a group, it won't be unilateral, a group of artists and, and folks that care about this community will make a decision what is the best way forward and best thing to do with those monuments but they will be removed based, based on working through a process. So there is no timeline set for removal. You don't have a, hey, we want to get this done by such and such target date. Th that body's work in the process. Okay. But I, I will say the focus is going to continue to be uh, very focused on COVID uh, and will be as long as it's with us. I have uh, scheduled formal weekly calls with hospitals. I've been doing that since the beginning, since March. Uh, local hospital leadership tells me that the way that we collaborate together is unique. Um, and then not only do is there a scheduled weekly call, uh, on, they can tell you on any given morning or night, I'll start calling them and talking through hospitalizations, ICUs, capacity, PPE. Uh, right now, and it's been this way for weeks, while hospitalizations are up, uh, they're handling it. Uh, and uh, ICUs are manageable. Uh, and so, it, look, anybody that's in the ICU right now, uh, you, you, you just, they got family members, they're scared, they're concerned, healthcare workers are, are working hard to help them get through it. Uh, so we have to face that reality until we get a vaccine. We also have to do everything we can to make sure that uh, people can lead somewhat of a normal life. And you mentioned it yourself, those numbers at one point came way down. The positivity right. rate was way down. Do you feel now looking at the numbers and the spike and the fact that the numbers are way higher than they were, do you feel that we opened the city up back too soon? Should we have kept it closed a little longer? These are all, Every leader making these decisions is making a judgment call based on the information that's given to them by any number of people, a number of factors. It's not just cases. It's not just hospitalizations. It's cases. It's hospitalizations. It's mental health. Uh, it's economic health, which can lead, which can lead to mental health. Uh, there's a whole host of factors that go into this. Uh, I believe that uh, our economy ought to be working. People ought to be back to work, but they ought to be wearing masks. That's why I mandated it. I would remind people before I mandated masks, if you go way back in this pandemic when it was uh, not cool to wear a mask, when people will say, I'll never wear a mask. I'm talking back, I don't know if it was March or April, it was early. Mm -hmm. I was wearing a mask and I was telling people to wear a mask. Uh, my daughter Bridget was making masks. So uh, those are the little things that experts tell us will make a difference in stopping the spread. And those are the types of things we need to be doing. Looking back on it, do you feel that we opened up too soon? I, I do not think we opened up too soon. I just think we've got to be smart. By that, if, 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 we, if any economy opened up too soon, then the next natural decision point would be to shut back down. And I don't think we should shut down. Uh, I think that uh, people ought to practice social distancing when they can, wear masks. I think if people can work from home, uh, if it works, um, they ought to try to do that. And a number of people are working from home these days. So I think that our citizens and our businesses are taking this seriously and doing what they can to slow the spread. I think when we saw the spikes, you saw uh, low numbers, and I think some people got complacent and comfortable. That's not a judgment. That's human nature, right? People saw really no low numbers. Uh, we heard of mass gatherings at uh, different parts of town where people were partying and hanging out. Probably shouldn't have done that. But I think even people that weren't uh, in mass large gatherings and hanging out, there was some level of complacency. You saw fewer masks in stores. People just felt good. Uh, so I think if, if, if we could do something differently back then, which we can't make this mistake now, is for, to remind people it's with us to be vigilant. If this thing drops to 2%, I think we're back down to 8% dailies, 10% cumulatives. Uh, by many metrics, uh, some say those are, those are good trends and those are numbers that uh, are not of huge concern, but we cannot relax and think things are okay. It's with us for the time being and we got to manage it. Is there a threshold point where you can see us reaching where you say, you know what, all right, we're going to have to shut her back down. Never say never. Right. How do you feel about I mean, it? You, you can never say. You can, in, a, in my job and role, you can never say never. You have no idea what's going to come on any given day. Um, 
And so uh, the, th the, the thing right now, I, I, we're not, I don't see us even being close to having to shut things down. We just gotta be smart. Uh, and I'm always asking our hospitals, can you handle the load? Are you good? Do you need to stop elective surgeries? Because by the way, if we're shutting the economy down, elective surgeries are probably stopping too. Elective surgeries are not unnecessary surgeries, right? They're surgeries that people need for their health. Uh, they could be life and death at some point if they don't get them done. So folks need to understand the full ramifications of a shutdown. You start shutting the economy down, you're shutting down elective surgeries. Hospitals are laying people off, which started to happen in March and April. We have to work together as a community to manage this. Okay. Um, couple more and I'm done. Okay. Uh, I would like to talk about the uh, violence in the city. Um, there are statistics that, you know, we follow. Right. We follow uh, the statistics that come from the city, the state. Um, and I can read you some that I, I asked our assignment desk to take a look at. You know, these are a lot of st statistics. I know you, you've heard them, yep. you probably know them, but um, 107 homicides, 86 murders this year. This was the earliest that Jacksonville hit 100 homicides since we've been keeping track mm -hmm. in 2006. 58 people have been shot so far in July, the most in a single month this year. The city is on track to exceed 500 people shot in 2020. What is it going to take to slow this down? At what point do you say what we are doing is not working? Well, I uh, work with our experts in law enforcement, which is our state attorney and our sheriff, and uh, uh, I, I'm supportive of them, and when they tell me what they need, I do everything I can to get them what they need. Uh, and then prevention and intervention is the other piece. I mean, that's why we invest in the Kids Hope Alliance. That's why we invest in uh, juvenile justice reform. Uh, we've done that over the last couple of years. Those things don't pay off immediately. So you start investing in summer camps and youth programs, a few years ago, uh, reform the way juveniles are treated when they get in trouble the first time, reform there, work with the state attorney on that. It's going to take time to see those outcomes. Same with cure violence, disruptors. Uh, it doesn't help that uh, in the middle of all this COVID. I mean, COVID disrupted uh, camps, summer camps. COVID disrupted uh, cure violence, violence disruptors. Uh, so uh, we have to continue to invest in those things. We know they work. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to keep ma remain vigilant and in, 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 in investing in things that experts in prevention, intervention, and enforcement tell me we ought to be investing in. Now I know there are some some ideas that have come from the community. Um, you know about these groups: the Comedic Empire, Jacksonville Community Action Committee. Um, they have the People's Budget. Are these ideas that you've gotten a chance to take a look at at all? Um, they haven't. Re I, I haven't seen their specific ideas. Okay. Um, they are, you know, people within that community that have ideas. Um, and is is that something that you'd be willing to listen to? Sit down. Sure. And listen yeah. To? But there's there's many voices in the community in the city, and I have for five years now met with and continue to meet and talk to people <clears throat> from all neighborhoods, zip codes, and backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So if, if, any, if any folks in those organizations are suggesting, A, that I'm not listening, that's not true. They're not the only voices. Uh, and then B, sure, I'm willing to hear. Okay. <clears throat> um, I am checking it. It looks like that is it. I do have one more quick question about the RNC, <laughs> uh, and then we're done. Yeah. Um, wondering... Um, you know, on Friday, and you went and talked to the networks. Yeah. I'm curious why you went to the networks and not to the local media. Well, I had, well, if you look at the media updates I've done since March uh, because of COVID, I mean, I have been in, incredibly accessible. There are, sometimes they're three, four times a week, sometimes they're twice a week. Mm -hmm. uh, we did an update that same week uh, with local media. The cable outlets had been requesting interviews of me, all three networks, for months. 
I did a couple, but not many. I mostly said no. Um, my communications team would tell you I said no way more than I said yes. In the last probably month, I've said no to all of them, Fox, CNN, and MSNBC. Uh, this was an opportunity. Uh, to, uh, we just felt it was the right time to say yes to them uh, after all the no's, knowing that I had provided regular updates with the media, and here we are today. That was a, that was a, that was the huge decision, the, the decision of all decisions, and I guess going to the networks as opposed to the local media may have caught some people a little off guard. That that that's where you chose to respond to what the president said. I have been fully accessible to local media for years, but specifically, I mean, you can look at the numbers. I think people are tired of seeing me on television because of the, the noon briefings we do on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just, we had said no to the national networks numerous times, and we just as a team decided. My team recommended it, and I said, yeah, let's do it. All right. Mayor Curry, thank you so thank much you. for your time. Yeah, I always, it. always a pleasure. Thanks.